And thanks everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. We may have some hiccups, things may go wrong. It doesn't matter, it's fermentation. I'm ridiculously excited about this. Last September, last September, I was peer pressured into going to the Ontario Fermentation Festival, which I thought, oh yawn, this will be terrible. It turned out it was amazing. And I began my love affair with sourdough at that time. And now we're going to have cabbage. <laughs> I couldn't be more happy. So we're hopefully gonna have a great evening. We're gonna learn about the science of fermentation. And then we're hopefully going to have a demo on how to make sauerkraut. So let's hope that all <laughs> works. This is, again, as Reinhardt said, normally we'd be in person, we are not. Um, but we wanna hear from you as we go along. So we're gonna have a Q&A session. You can submit your questions or your comments, whatever you've got in the chat box or via Twitter, so at RCI Science, or you can email us at information at rciscience.ca. So um, this is, remember to be polite and respectful, you know, with your questions. We are monitoring the chat box. So if you're not, we're gonna catch you off. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for the evening, our first speaker for the evening, uh, Dr. Amy Fru. Uh, and I think she's gonna come on. I am. There we are. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> Fabulous. So Amy is a professor and academic program coordinator for culinary innovation and food technology at Niagara College. That's got to be like the best title ever. Um, she found we have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, culinary innovation and food technology. So uh, Amy founded the Canadian Food and Wine Institute Innovation Center at Niagara College back in 2012. Um, the Innovation Center is to support food manufacturing companies to access high quality science in ways that will increase their capacity to innovate and grow. This is exactly what RCI Science is all about, is bringing science to everyone. Amy is currently the president-elect for the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology, and she sits on the National Board of Directors for Food Processing Skills Canada. She's kind of a big deal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the building in food science is dominating her current research, which is focused on food science educator development, understanding the transition between science education and industrial development, and innovation practice for small business. Take it away, Amy. Awesome. I am so honored to be here for the kickoff event and was really delighted to receive the invitation from Reinhard and Suzanne and the team behind the science event. Um, honestly, the theme of biodiversity is this year's NSERC theme for its uh, Science Literacy Week. And honestly, fermentation is such an exciting theme to think about because the biodiversity of fermentation is really quite profound. Uh, Reinhardt mentioned that fermentation is so common in northern climates, but equally too, many of the fermentations that are so common in our diet are actually from equatorial regions because preservation under the warm, um, high temperature environment meant that uh, pre-industrialization, there needed to be really high quality means of extending the shelf life of all that wonderful product that people were uh, creating. So. Give me a second here. I'm going to switch over to my slideshow. i am got to figure out how to share my screen here. So I'm going to click share screen. Entire screen share. And pardon me, I, I'm going to jump in here. But uh, again, I, I am really, really fortunate to be at Niagara College and was able to join in a really entrepreneurial mindset. Um, back in 2012, I helped found the NSERC funded um, Innovation Center. And uh, since then, my role has evolved a lot. And now I really focus a lot more of my work on um, entrepreneurship and innovator development and do a lot of work in education. I always like to give gratitude to a lot of the uh, food science um, inspirations that came before me. I was really extremely fortunate in my career to have the chance to have courses with Dr. Norm Borlaug when I did my PhD at Iowa State University. And he was very inspirational in, in terms of how I teach. He, he would come into the classroom and um, insist that we not only be extremely good scientists, but we also be extremely good uh, communicators and go out and advocate for the communities that we're trying to serve. 
And just to uh, read out his quote, I want to see science serve a useful purpose to improve the standard of living for all people. You can't build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. And honestly, um, that aspect of advocacy behind the science that we do is so resonant in the way that I work with uh, small, small businesses and the way I work with my students. I am really lucky to be at Niagara College and food and wine is what we do all day long. Um, honestly, we have an amazing team of food scientists, of culinary specialists, and we get to think about food all day. <laughs> and it's, it's a pretty cool scenario that we spend our day working on increasing the science literacy both of students as well as the um, different stakeholders that come through our door. Um, so many of them are small businesses and they reach out to us and say, how do we do our food processing better? How do we apply good science in a useful way? And so teaching is really, really important. I love fermentation. Honestly, um, it was a ton of fun and later on I'll introduce you to my show and tell collection of some of the different fermentation products that we have out there. But so many of the different food products that we're eating on a daily basis are fermented foods. Um, you likely started your breakfast this morning with a bunch of fermented foods that uh, could include a piece of toast. That bread is a fermented food. Maybe you had some different pickles or sauces on a sandwich for your lunch. Maybe you had some yogurt with your lunch. These are all fermented foods as well. And um, then there's even foods that we don't think about that are fermented. Many of the ingredients that we're including in the processed foods that we have are fermented foods. If you had, uh, maybe you had a soda pop and it had citric acid in it. That citric acid was a product of industrial fermentation. Almost every food that we are eating in some shape or form has fermentation behind it. So it's it's a pretty exciting field to research and it's it's something that is also really accessible to people at home that fermentation isn't just something that goes on in big huge factories. You can you can set this up in your own home kitchen and it's such a wonderful way to access science with kids and teenagers so that they can get a sense that, yeah, science is accessible, science is fun, science you can eat. And that's the best feeling of all, that when you can do an experiment and then you can eat the results at the end, that's really, really cool. Now, I promised that I would have lots of science content. And so let's take a look at one of our favorite pathways. And this is the glycolytic pathway. We've got glucose and we are, oh, at step number one, we are taking ADP and we are producing ATP. For those of you who took high school science and you did that Krebs cycle, you know that ATP is the powerhouse that runs cells. We need ATP and every cell is using it in a way that it's using for all sorts of different uh, metabolic pathways. ATP is the batteries that make life happen. So in the most basic type of fermentation, we are seeing glucose broken up so that we are recharging those ATP batteries. And in the meantime, we are producing pyruvate. And as part of that, we are producing carbon dioxide. Oh, carbon dioxide, this could be fun. And we also get out there acetaldehyde, which is converted to ethanol when we're doing the recharge of the nic um, NAD or nicotine adenine dinucleotide. So we are producing ethanol, we are producing CO2, carbon dioxide from glucose. That's the most basic of fermentation pathways. And honestly, it's perhaps the most fun of fermentation pathways. I can't see the chat box, but I'm going to bet you uh, lots of you already know what the fun is. It's, uh, and so cheers to you if you got it. Um, honestly, that is the pathway that is one of our most fun fermentations. It is how we are creating the alcohol that we enjoy as wine, as beer, as distilled spirits. We harness that fermentation for uh, much of what's going on. It's also the same fermentation that's going on in bread. And so while you're thinking about it, in the case of bread, we're not capitalizing against the ethanol, we're actually capitalizing against the CO2. The carbon dioxide is what is inflating the bread and giving it the nice lofty uh, sponge-like texture that is occurring in that fermentation. So that's one of our most basic fermentations. And it's likely 
one of the most common ones that are out there. Um, here's some Saccharomyces yeast. And this is a scanning electron microscope. Again, if, if any of you want to find out where the references are for this, uh, just reach out to the wonderful folks at um, the Society, and I would be glad to connect with you directly. So Saccharomyces yeast are wonderful, wonderful little tiny factories, if I can uh, use that term. They are very small, but at the same time, too, you, you can often see them in quantity large enough um, so many of the different uh, microorganisms that we think of in food are in in uh, quantities that are invisible. But in the case of Saccharomyces yeast, we are using it in very, very large quantity, just in, in such, sm they are microscopically small. It's, it's really cool. You can see the budding scars on these yeast. They grow out almost like a balloon where they balloon out to the side and then that splits off. That's how the, the yeast are multiplying. And you can see these bud scars on the yeast. Oh, we get even better. <laughs> the thing is we see that singular um, fermentation pathway. There are so many more diverse fermentation pathways. This happens to be the Loire pathway. And it was an Argentinian scientist uh, who received the Nobel prize for discovering this pathway um, many years ago, I believe it was 1970. And this is the um, emden meyerhoff uh, pathway. And we also have the hexose monophosphate shunt. These are also important fermentation pathways that are occurring in, and then in this case, this is the pathway that lactose is fermented in dairy products. So if you had some cheese with your sandwich at lunchtime, you are taking advantage of this lactose fermentation pathway because lactose from milk is going to be first split into galactose and glucose. So lactose is a, is a disaccharide sugar. It's got two pieces to it. So we've first got to split it into galactose and glucose. And then those are shunted into two different pathways. The galactose is fermented most commonly in what's called a homofermentative uh, pathway. And that's where we're producing um, we're producing lactate salts from that, but you can also have heterofermentative pathways where you are producing lactic, or lactic acid as well, but also ethanol and acetate. Acetate being the um, organic acid behind vinegar. And so it's, it's nice to think of in, in very reductive forms. Food scientists often make a joke saying, we are the scientists that deal with the wonderful, messy, and horrible soup of all cells dying. And we have to extend that life of, of the cells dying in long, long progressions as much as possible. We are capturing the, uh, the, the life and all the enzymatic activity of the living cells, and we're converting it into an art form where we're taking advantage of all of these different biochemical pathways and adjusting all of the different parameters within time, temperature, salt conditions, and so on to be able to achieve an art, to be quite frank. We want to have good lactic acid formation in our cheese, or maybe we want to have propionic acid or acetate occurring. We're, we're, we're leveraging all these different pathways in ways that are going to create the foods that we want. Here's another scanning electron microscope diagram of uh, some lactobacillus. And I always joke with my students that uh, the students that come from countries where Latin languages are spoken, French, Spanish, um, Italian, they have an advantage. Lactobacillus uh, comes from milk and bacillus is the Latin word for stick. So sticks in your milk. And you can see that lovely rod shape that is, is um, where the naming is coming from. And it, I always always laugh saying, you come to my chemistry class, you're gonna speak Latin at the end. But uh, so many of the different organisms that we uh, have created names for, those names are coming from the Latin. And that's long history of science being communicated in Latin. I loved finding this scanning electron microscope um, image because this is a SEM of cabbage. And we will be we will be taking a look at cabbage. the The scientist who uh, would have taken this image decided to color each of the different species organisms in a slightly different color. And so, oftentimes when we're thinking of fermentation, and 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 I know there's biochemists, and, and Reinhardt is a biochemist by trade. 
honestly, we think in very discrete systems. When we're talking about food, we're talking about a wonderful biodiverse system. And in the case of fermenting cabbage, you can have a whole wide variety of different um, lactobacillus, you can have different yeasts, and we take advantage of that immense biodiversity when approaching the fermentation that we're going to be accomplishing. Now, in the case of Saccharomyces, we talked about Saccharomyces. Again, that's the yeast that is most common in um, uh, alcoholic fermentations and in bread fermentations. And it's really quite neat to think about the ecosystems that are existing around Saccharomyces yeast. Oftentimes, Saccharomyces yeast is introduced into food systems by social insects, uh, flies, bees, wasps, etc., dropping the yeast onto that product. And those yeasts, again, are often living in a community with other different organisms that are going to be either promoting its growth or reducing its growth. So for example, we've got lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria down here. The exometabolites of these organisms, so you can guess lactobacillus or lactic acid bacteria, these are organisms that their primary exometabolite is going to be lactic acid on fermentation of, of simple sugars. That production of lactic acid acts as an inhibition to Saccharomyces yeast. Same with Acetobacter or Gluconobacter. These are bacteria that are, as you can guess, Acetobacter. It's going to be creating acetic acid, which is vinegar. These are bacteria that through the production of acetate are going to have an inhibiting factor on the growth of Saccharomyces. And so we have to really think in very, uh, very deliberate ecosystems when thinking about food fermentations. Now, again, I mentioned at the very beginning, the most simple of fermentation cycles is that uh, a glycolytic pathway, but there are so many other um, biosynthetic pathways that are going on in the different organisms. This is a diagram that's showing some of the different esters that are occurring during yeast fermentation. And there, there's some really great science behind uh, looking at yeast and finding different um, different uh, species of yeast that produce esters that give um, really delightful um, flavor profiles to some of the alcoholic beverages that we are uh, enjoying. And there's some really great scientists. George Vandermeer at uh, the University of Guelph is one of them. I've got some friends like Nate Ferguson at Escarpment Labs, and they are yeast. They're yeast farmers. They actually use that term and they joke about it. But what they do is they go and they harvest Saccharomyces and other um, complementary yeasts such as Britannomyces. And they, they isolate those yeasts to look for very specific ester production. And they're looking for amplified ester production that is going to accentuate wonderful flavor profiles in alcoholic beverages. And I think that's a pretty awesome job to have to be a yeast farmer and think of, I get to create esters from that. But honestly, um, there's, a, there's a really interesting advantage to this too. If you are in the food manufacturing sector, right now so many consumers want to have natural flavors. And rather than having synthetic or um, artificial flavors as you'd read it on an ingredient declaration, these, um, uh, they're exactly identical to the naturally occurring esters from uh, fruits and vegetables, but from a labeling perspective, they can be labeled as a natural flavoring agent. And so there's a there's not just uh, within the alcohol community, there's a lot of interest to be harvesting yeast and their fermentation powers for um, creation of fine chemicals of all sorts of different types. Another thing that's really cool about fermentation, we talked to uh, uh, Reinhardt mentioned that Fermentation of fruits and vegetables is common in northern climates, but again, it's also quite common across the world. I brought up this slide because, to be honest, this is what I spent a lot of my time in my PhD studies on. Um, I had the chance to work on foods made out of corn or maize. And one aspect of fermentation is that it does increase the nutritional quality of a lot of different products. On fermentation, you are often degrading not just the uh, sugar or carbohydrate component. In many cases, during fermentation, you are also degrading proteins or other um, biological components within the food product. And I brought this slide up because 
In the case of many grain products, fermentation acts as a enhancer of nutrition by breaking down phytic acid. And so um, phytic acid happens to be, uh, for those of you who are chemists here, you can see all these wonderful uh, phosphate groups have negative charges and they're, if phyt phytate binds up um, divalent cations within the diet. So iron, zinc, copper, they're tightly bound to phytic acid and they're excreted out in the feces rather than absorbed. And so by breaking down phytic acid during lactic acid fermentation, you're going to be increasing the bioavailability of the divalent uh, cations within the diets, especially iron and zinc. So fermentation is extremely powerful when it comes to being able to improve global nutrition. And there's a huge history of fermented food products in much of Sub-Saharan Africa is again, fermentation, and I'll talk about this in a slide in a moment, has a, a protective effect. We mentioned how the exometabolites of many of the uh, beneficial fermentation organisms act as inhibitory factors on some of the other spoilage organisms that could be reducing the shelf life of these food products. Oh, this one's fun. I uh, Before I went to Niagara College, I used to work for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in meat processing programs. And oftentimes we don't think about the fact that we're not just fermenting fruits and vegetables. In many cases, we're fermenting meat or fish. And there's some really famous uh, fermented animal products. Um, Surastraming is one of them. It's a, uh, it's a fish, um, canned fish product that's um, almost eaten like a dare because it's so potently smelly. Um, salami, um, prosciutto, these are all fermented meat products as well. And honestly, uh, we've got a wide variety of different yeast molds and um, we're taking advantage of the fact that we're not just breaking down the glycogen within that meat. The glycogen would be the stored carbohydrate energy source that uh, skeletal muscle would be using for um, ATP generation. We store it as glycogen and, and, and break it down into glucose, which is then used for glycolysis. But um, during that fermentation, the glycogen is broken down and slowly turned into lactic acid. But we also, from the various organisms in that fermentation, see proteolysis and lipolysis. And that's where we're getting a lot of the free amino acids that create that great umami flavor that we get in good quality um, fermented meat. And we get some of the free fatty acids and lipolytic products that have really nice flavor profile. I brought this slide up and I, I regret I didn't have my camera uh, last week, uh, but we also ferment things like soybeans. Tempeh is becoming more and more popular. And I noted that Maple Leaf Foods now has a tempeh product that they are selling under their Lifeline label. Fermenting, again, is such a really neat way of increasing the nutritional quality of food products. And it is a really amazing way of introducing so much cultural diversity. Tempeh is originally from the Indonesian region and they would have taken a wide variety of different grains and soaked them and the natural flora the Rhizopus oligosporus uh, mold organism in this case it's a it's a mold based fermentation that we're seeing the Rhizopus oligosporus organism that's commonly found on banana leaves rapidly inoculates that grain as it's being stored and again we're seeing really good reduction of phytic acid and a bit of proteolysis to improve the nutritional quality of those grains as compared to just eating them as a boiled grain. This is a uh, tempeh that we made in class. I love doing fermentation work with my students and um, introducing them into some of these products is, is really cool. I brought up this slide too, besides the fact that I ride my bicycle past this plant every weekend. Um, fermentation is not just something that's done at the household level, it's an incredibly important industrial process. This is young buns flour and it's in down in Port Colborne, Ontario. And young buns flour is one of the world's largest producer of uh, citric acid. So what are they doing? They're bringing in corn, that's the Welland Canal on the, on the left side of the photo. They're bringing in ships of corn and converting that corn, the starch within that corn, as you know, starch is just long branch chain of glucose. They're breaking that down and using the, the 
uh, potential of Aspergillus niger, which is a, a fungal organism, and capitalizing on its capability to produce citric acid. is trying to learn more about science that they say, well, that's all synthetic and like chemicals are everywhere. Chemicals, it, it's really quite cool to think about. Now, so many people are enjoying fermented foods because there's a potentially um, beneficial aspect to the gut microbiota in nutrition and um, increasing the biodiversity of the organisms within our gut is part of it. And you'll see all sorts of different potential uh, diseases that are caused by minimized biodiversity within the gut and a lot of potential positives from consuming. This came from a really great review in the British Medical Journal uh, back in 2018. Um, again, one reason for uh, having a biodiverse microflora within the human gut is that there's all sorts of different potential ways that the organisms that are fermenting away inside your gut, we have about two kilos of bacteria and, uh, and uh, fungus within our gut at any period of time. They're fermenting away based off of the different prebiotic components that are within our diet, soluble fibers and so on. Many of the different organic acids that are being produced during that process have and net health benefits and many of the short chain fatty acids and lipolytic products are also being investigated um, quite actively by the scientific community to identify if there's uh, potential health benefits from this. Part of that fermentation too though is that we know that based off of uh, poor management you may end up with a bit of gas. Hey back to that original fermentation cycle CO2 is part of fermentation. Now, what is really interesting, we've got all of these potential health claims that are being investigated, but Health Canada right now, it's really challenging for the food industry because it's hard to make strange specific claims. And I looked in the guide to food labeling for industry, and right now you cannot make any strange specific claims for food products. So you can't be out there saying lactobacillus improves your digestion. It's just not allowed by Health Canada at this point. And this is something that the scientific community can go out and do more advocacy on. Right now, there are non-strain specific claims. And I pulled this also from the Guide for Food Labeling for Industry. This is the regulatory Bible or holy book, if you want to um, be inclusive. It is the regulatory book that every food manufacturer has to work against in Canada. And right now, the really the only thing you can say about um, having fermented foods is that probiotics naturally form part of the gut flora or is it's or it contributes to healthy gut flora. Honestly, the, the claims that you can make are pretty lackluster. And so the, the, the burden for food companies is that they also have to have shelf life studies and they have to go through a major document submission. And then after they've gone through that submission, other companies can take advantage of the submission that's done by one company. Companies in Canada are a little bit uh, shy to use probiotic claims because there was also a major class action lawsuit in 2010 with Group Danone and their Dan Active yogurt. And it was a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit that was lost by the food company relative to their probiotic claims. I always tell my students who are studying science, look at the surrounding politics and the regulatory environment that you're working in because that's going to be just as important. Now, one of the big challenges in fermentation is that retailers want to see products sit on a shelf. And honestly, in general, for uh, most pickle products, they want an 18 month to two year shelf life. And so oftentimes we have to work with food processors and find what are called log reduction times. Organisms within that food product based off of time and temperature combinations, we can kill them off and use statistical process control. And I know that sounds, sounds horrible after we've gone to all that effort, but this is the balancing act that we as food scientists have to, have to face.
In many cases, we are able to set up a fermentation and create stability because we have created the competitive inhibition where the metabolites that, uh, that are supporting the fermentation are, are used up and the exometabolites, all those wonderful organic acids act as inhibitors. But in, uh, in other cases, the retailers say, we don't want to put up with the risk. We want you to pasteurize it. And the, I spend a lot of time helping companies with these pasteurization cycles because it's a little bit tricky, but I, I noted some of my students were in the chat box. Hi, students. Um, they get to learn how to do all of this uh, process methodology and help companies with that time temperature. There's a lot of different tools um, that scientists use for fermentation, water activity, uh, titratable acidity. Some of these tools just happen to be things that are quite affordable. Um, uh, the, this is a hydrometer and it's used for measuring the brine concentration of salt. And you can pick those up for about $10 online. And this is a refractometer. Some of the different fermentations, you want to be able to track the, ref, uh, the bricks value or the soluble solids content. And these are quite affordable tools that help bring science into the home. You can find these on Amazon for pretty cheap, uh, $20, $30. Water activity meter, that's a couple thousand dollars. Just to round out my talk here, I did want to put my top picks, and I believe the I believe the folks are going to post this in the chat box, but I chose a couple books. Some of them are more focused on uh, recipes that you can do at home, but they're written really well with a really good science basis. Sandra Alex Katz, Wild Fermentation is one of my favorite. David Zilber, who's a Toronto-based chef, worked with Rene Redzepi on the Noma Guide to Fermentation. I also put in there um, Health Canada's official methods for microbiological analysis of foods. I, I can't stress this enough. Health Canada and many of the regulatory agencies in Canada share their scientific protocols. And all you have to do is reach out to them and ask and say, hey, can I see all of the microbiology protocols used by food companies in Canada? And they'll send you a zip file. And just starting to read about science, even though much of it may be, if you're, if you're new to science or you're a student, it may be over your head. I really like how wonderful the science community is in Canada. And people reach out by email or through LinkedIn. And, and if you ask really good questions, it's very, very rare that people won't answer you. Start reading, ask good questions. I also put in uh, FAO's Fermented Fruits and Vegetables, a global perspective. And last but not least, to round it out, uh, Dr. Wendy Keenly's side at the University of Guelph has an open access textbook on microbiology. And I just, I just uh, really encourage people to just start reading and asking questions. And there's so many wonderful scientists in Canada who just love science communication, reach out to them. And if you have a really good question, I bet they'll answer. Just wanted to round out my talk with some of my students and I love my students and we have so much fun working with all sorts of different foods and fermentations and food science is awesome. I highly, highly recommend investigating more about food science. We, we get to eat our experiments. So we'll leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amy. I just love that idea of science you can eat. I mean, what could be better? Science and eating. The two best things ever. Also, I had no idea I now want to be a yeast farmer. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I want to do that. That's great. And hi to Amy's students if you're listening. That's terrific.